now we have an, a man, Talon Hansel, who developed in 1959 the log rank test, which is, as we'll see, is kind of the analogy of the t-test for survival data. So we know, we know how to treat, how to look at one sample, how to summarize it. Now let's move up to two samples, the so-called log rank test. So again, we're looking at the brain cancer data, and we have males and females who want to compare their survival. Well, let's start with the Kappa-Meyer curves. Here they are. Uh, blue is female and green is male. And it looks like there's a slight advantage for females here. The question is, is it, is it significant? We've only got 88 patients, so we don't know whether this is actually a, a real effect or just maybe uh, within the noise. So yes, females seem to fare a little better up to 50 months, but then both the curves level off around 50%. How can we carry out a test of the two survival curves? Again, it looks like, you know, when we hear two samples, we think of t-test, but again, the sensoring creates a complication, right? So to overcome the challenge, we'll conduct what's called a log rank test. And log rank test actually is very much, it has the same kind of structure as Kaplan-Meier. It's gonna proceed it's going to sum up things over the, the, the failure times. So let's call the unique failure times or death times D1 through DK. Let RK be the number of patients at risk at DK, and QK the number of patients who died at DK. And the number at risk at uh, DK we'll call R1K and R2K in the two groups, right? In this case, males and females. So, so Rob, the RK hmm. is the number of patients who died at time DK. So you're assuming that more than one person can die at, at these times. I think you said R. RK? RK is the number oh, at, risk. at risk. And, and QK, right? QK is the number who died at DK. Right. So it, it, is, yeah, it is possible, some studies, especially if the time is sort of measured discreetly, maybe not by days, by months, you can have more than one patient dying at a given time. I see. Okay. In the simplest case, QK will be one, or will be one yeah. basically. But the log rank test can easily, can seamlessly handle the case where there's tied survival times. Okay. And this just says the number of patients, the total number of patients at risk are called RK and the total number who died QK. Okay. So what I just said is we summarize in this table. Here's the two groups, say males and females. Here's the number that died. Again, normally there'll be a, one of these will be a one and the other will be a zero, but it's possible to have. Um, so this, is, this a is a special little table just right. for the death time at DK. Exactly. Right. So we, we're looking at the whole sort of process, but we're, it's, a, it's a cross section saying, okay, at, at one time DK, this is what we see. And we, we're gonna have such a table for each DK. And we said this already, if the death time is unique, then, then one of these is a one and the other is a zero. Okay, so how do we use this table now to construct a test statistic to test whether the two groups are the same, their survival is, is the same? Well, in general, if you have a random variable x, what you do is you, and you want to test whether the mean of x is zero, what you do is you, you, you take x you, and you center it by the, the, the expectation of x under the null hypothesis, h zero, and you divide by its standard deviation. So the x here we're going to use is we're going to use the, 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 the sum of the number of people that died in the top left table. In other words, if we go back here, right, if group one is much worse than group two in survival, we expect to see a lot of ones here and a lot of zeros here, right? And vice versa for group two. So you want to see whether the, the number of, the total number of people who died in group one at each risk set is at large compared to what we expect it to be. If they had the same survival rate. Exactly. So this gets a little complicated and the, the details are in the text, but, but essentially we're going to sum up over risk sets the, the number in the top left corner, that's the number that died in group one, minus what we'd expect to see if the two groups were the same, divided by its standard deviation. And what we expect to see if the two groups are the same is just the total number at risk times the proportion that were in group one. Right? So, so R1K is the total number at risk in, in the first group. Exactly. But the proportion is over the, it's the merged groups, right? That it's the, the total deaths, mm -hmm. irrespective of group. So that's the proportion overall. Right. And so you want to see if it's just divided up proportionally. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that yep. nasty thing in the bottom is the standard deviation? Yes. The which, variance? Yeah. yeah. The, the details of which are in yeah. the book. We don't need to bore you, bore you with this right now. And then it's summed over all the, the death times. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So you're saying on the, on the average is the number of people we see in group one that die. Is it more, more or less than we'd expect if the two groups were the same? And as is always the case, it's often the case in statistics, when one forms a normalized test statistic, uh, 
what you do is you say, well, if the sample size is large, this is going to be approximately normal 0, 1, standard normal distribution. So we can, we can look at a normal table. We can compare the W to a normal table and determine whether what we're seeing is a departure large enough that we would or would not expect it by chance. And we get a p-value from that. Okay. Okay, let's see what it does. Ba ba ba. Well, not too exciting. The log rank gave a W of 1.2 oh. and with a corresponding two-sided p-value of 0.2. Why are we using a two-sided p-value here, Trevor? Oh, is it, that's uh, a surprise uh, question. Statistics 101. <laughs> well, we'd, just be, we'd be equally surprised if, if the male survival time was worse than the females or vice versa. And so, right. you know, we don't want to look at the result and then just test what we see. Right. We, you know, a priori, we weren't, we'd be surprised either direction. Right, so it makes the test uh, more objective, more unbiased. Otherwise, we'd be f favoring as a, what our null hypothesis is. Okay. Phew. So, overall, we, we can't reject the null hypothesis of no difference in survival curves, right? Because the p-value is not very small. But as we, we've seen in the course, this doesn't mean necessarily there is no difference. It could mean that we don't have much power to find that difference. Maybe our study wasn't big enough, in particular. We had 88 patients. Maybe if we had 8,000 patients, we could, there may be a difference. 88 patients in total. Right. Some were censored. Many right. were censored. That's a good point. Um, the, the real sample size in survival analysis isn't so much the actual sample size, but the number of events, right? Because the censored observations provide partial information, but only a little bit. They helped in the denominators, right. but we were counting the a number of deaths. Right. Those were in the th 30s total and uh, right. divided by two groups, so right. quite small. So that's always important to remember the survival analysis, mm. the sample size isn't quite what it seems. So that's the log rank test. It's closely related to, to Cox's proportional hazards model, which we discuss next. Okay, so we've seen the one sample and how to summarize it with the Kaplan Meyer. We've seen the two sample problem where we use a log rank test, and now we'll move up to regression, which is sort of the more general, more commonly occurring situation. Okay, so again, we have our survival time, and we observe the minimum of the actual survival time and the censoring time. Well, again, well, if, if you think about it as a regression, a supervised learning problem, we would be tempted maybe not to regress Y on X, or maybe since Y has a long right tail typically, being a survival time, maybe log Y. But again, the censoring creates a problem. We can't just do that because we don't, we don't know how to deal with the censoring. Okay. So we're going to use an, a, sequ a sequential construction similar to the idea used in the Kaplan-Meier curve. And you'll see this coming up all the time in survival analysis. You think of it as a process that, that unfolds in time and you model it sort of time point by time point, failure time by failure time. So we've seen that for Kaplan-Meier, we've done that for log rank, and now for... Just Regression. one thing um, that's maybe worth saying, the Kaplan-Meier curve, it's, it's, you know, it's like a, a distribution function which you just fit to your data. In other words, we say it's non-parametric. It doesn't right. really make any assumptions, right? But it does take into account the, the censoring. And from that point of view, it's attractive. Right, and maybe you're, you're, while you bring this in, is that this, the next method, the proportional hazards model, we'll see right now, carries that theme on. Basically, it, it's got a sort of a semi-parametric component, which, which makes it quite robust to, to departures from, from, to the, from modeling assumptions. So let's see how this works. So we, before we get there, we need to learn sort of a new uh, quantity, the, the hazard rate or hazard function. I warned you. <laughs> uh, also known as the force of mortality. So what is it? Well, let's look at it. So this is a, again, it's a theoretical quantity. This is a, a function of the, of the random variable t. It's a probability that, that t falls between t and t plus delta, given t is greater than t, as delta t goes to zero. It's kind of a derivative, but what it's saying is it's a probability of dying in the next instant from now, given you've survived up to this time. Okay, so that's why it's called the force of mortality, kind of a scary quantity for people our age <laughs> getting up there. Turns out that if you know the survival distribution, you can just compute this quantity. It's just another way of right. representing that. Right. So the, the, the survival, the, the S of T is actually, as Trevor said, you can, there's a one-to-one -one map between the hazard and the survivor function. But this turns out to be a convenient quantity for, for the model that comes up next, the proportional hazards model. And this is due to David Cox in a very famous paper in 1972, which has now become known as the proportional hazards model. Okay, so what is the proportional hazards model? Okay, again, we're, we're, the point 
of this section is a, a regression now. We want to model covariates or features and how they affect the outcome. So there's our features x, x i, j. That's an x i is for observation i and feature j. We've got p such features. Now we're going to assume that the hazard for an individual with features x i at time t is some what's called a, a baseline hazard function that's unspecified times this factor. Okay. Well, the, what's the exponential doing here? Well, the hazard function has to be positive, right? It's a probability. So the exponential is really the main reason for it there is to make this a positive quantity. So this hazard now is the, it's a hazard function for an individual with features x i. If x is zero, we get the baseline hazard. So what this is saying is the hazard for, for an individual who's got a certain feature is some common hazard that everybody has times a factor which either increases or decreases his hazard, depending on the, whether the betas are positive or negative. And the beauty of this model is that that common hazard, we're not going to really make too many assumptions about it. It's just going to be sort of like the Kaplan-Meier in a way. It's just, you know, it's going to be a non-parametric. Exactly. And we'll see how that's done in a couple of slides. So this quantity is, 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 is called the relative risk for this feature vector, right? The relative risk, if we have an individual with these feature values compared to an individual with all zero, that's the baseline, the ratio of their hazards is this second quantity. So it's, that's why it's called the relative risk. If this is 1.2, for example, it says an individual with these features is 1.2 times as likely to die as an individual with these feature values. In the next instant. In the next, right. Actually, actually at all time, right? At all time. At all time. Okay. Because that's, oh, there's, no, there's it, no T It doesn't here. depend on T. Exactly. Right. And I, as, as like we've said, and Trevor said, that what this model is saying is it makes no assumptions about the functional form of the baseline hazard, which is very nice. It means it can ad adapt itself to, to a, a lot of different situations without having to specify uh, exactly the, the hazard for the, a baseline individual. It makes it flexible. Again, the only assumption is that the features come in as a factor that increases or decreases the relative risk by a constant factor, depending on the parameters. Of course, these parameters we're going to estimate from data, just like we did in, in, in regression. Rob, wasn't one of your very first papers on Cox proportional hazards model? Uh, that's right. Uh, when I was still a graduate student and working at a medical center, a, a, a doctor I was working with didn't understand the model, and he said, you should write a very... He was British. He said, you should write a very simple explanation of proportional hazards. So I wrote a paper called A Plain Man's Guide to the Proportional Hazards Model. A lovely paper. Actually, I'm kind of proud of it still. <laughs> no, I wasn't being facetious. <laughs> okay. It really is lovely. Okay, so... I should read it sometime. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, so here, here's an example of proportional hazards just to uh, sort of reinforce what it's really saying. Let's take the simplest case where we have a single covariate and it's it's zero, one. So it's a, it's a two group case, right? Maybe males and females or whatever. Okay. Here's the hazard function, the log hazard functions and the survival probability for, it says here, xi equals zero is green and xi equals one is black. Proportional hazards means the gap between these two ha log hazards is a constant, right? It also turns out to imply that the survival curves don't cross. And we see an example here. As time goes on, they get farther and farther apart, but they don't cross. So there's uh, the proportionality is for the hazard, the one on the left. Yes. The, when you map it back to the survival function, it's a different kind of relationship. Right. It's, a, it's, a, this, it's in the book, but it's a little more yeah. complicated. It's, since the model is expressed in terms of the hazard, then the, on the log scale, you see this constant gap. Over here, the gap's not constant, mm -hmm. but it doesn't cross. On the other hand, if we had a situation like this where the hazards cross, this group's doing better for a while and then worse later, then the survival curves also cross, and this is a non-proportional hazard situation. So proportional hazards model um, without f modification can't really capture this situation. So it's a convenient yeah. assumption, yeah. which is often reasonable. It's often reasonable. And there are ways to check it, and we just talk in the book a bit about that and the, with references, but it's a good starting model. It's often very, very effective.